Well, thank you all for coming to my talk. What I want to do today is talk about the evolution of sensory perception. I'm going to start with the basic premise that to understand why brains work the way that they do, we need to understand how it is that brains have evolved. Now, of course, this is a very big question. So I'm going to narrow it down a bit and ask, what are the evolutionary changes to neural circuits that mediate species differences in sensory perception? And I'm going to address this question through a case study. We have a system in which there has been, that has a well-characterized neural circuit underlying sensory processing. And in that system, there has been substantial evolutionary change in perception over a relatively short evolutionary time span. And so the fish I'm going to talk about are mormarid fishes. Uh, many of you know about these fish, thanks to the work of the Sata lab, uh, who also work uh, uh, on different questions on these fish. And these fish communicate with each other using electricity. So these fish, uh, there, there are hundreds of species of these fish. They are found throughout sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the Nile River Basin. And these fish communicate with each other using electricity. So if we were to do a cross section back near the base of the tail here, you would see this specialized structure, modified muscle cells that constitute an electric organ. And if you stick a pair of wires in the water near the fish, hook it up to hook those up to an amplifier and plot the re resulting voltage over time, you see this characteristic waveform that we call the electric organ discharge or the EOD. And these fish also have electroreceptors distributed all over the surface of the body. You can see these, these small white specks scattered all over the head of the fish. These are electroreceptors for receiving these electric organ discharges. So they have a system for both generating and receiving these signals. And one of the, the functions of this system is communication. The fish talk to each other with electricity. And some of the early uh, work uh, in these fish by my uh, PhD mentor, Carl Hopkins, uh, discovered, he discovered that uh, this EOD is a species specific signal. So if we look here, uh, here we are in Gabon and on, on the west coast of Africa on the equator. And looking in this one river here, the Avindo River of Gabon, here, here's a representation of all the known species of more married fish located in this one river. And what, what I want you to see is that each species has its own characteristic EOD waveform. They differ in the duration of the waveform, they differ in the number of peaks or phases found in the waveform, and they differ in the relative polarity and durations and amplitudes of those different phases. Okay, so we have a species specific signal used for communication. These fish have a sensory system that's dedicated to communication behavior. So I, I should note that this sensory pathway is a completely different sensory pathway from the one studied in the Sawtell lab. In the Sawtell lab, they study pathways that are relevant to passive and active electrolocation, so sensor, sensing the outside environment. This pathway is de devoted solely to processing the communication signals from other fish. So what we're looking at here is we're looking down at the top of the brain. Here are the olfactory bulbs, spinal cord, cerebellum sitting on top of the brain. So here's a, here's an, a receptor. It projects up into the hindbrain, into this area called NELL, the nucleus of the electrosensory lobe. And then from NELL, it projects bilaterally up into the midbrain, into this area called ELA, and from ELA to ELP. EL stands for exterolateral because this part of the brain, uh, th these regions of the brain stick out the side of the brain. And we basically have an anterior part and a posterior part. Now, how do we know that this system is devoted solely to processing communication signals? Well, it turns out that the fish's electromotor system generates a corollary discharge. I'm sure from Sawtell's lab's work, you've heard a lot about corollary discharges. Well, in this pathway, the corollary discharge, it sends a copy of the motor command signal for the fish to generate its own EOD. It sends a copy of that signal to this NELL region in the hindbrain and briefly inhibits it. So every time the fish generates its own EOD, its motor system silences the neurons in the hindbrain here. So that information responses to its own EOD never make it past the hindbrain and up into the midbrain. So that this pathway is, is, is essentially deaf to the fish's own discharge. It only hears the discharges of other fish. And so it functions solely in processing those communication signals. Now, when you wanna think about linking uh, neurons and networks to behavior, this is a huge advantage, right? 
This circuit is dedicated to just one purpose in the animal's life, processing the communication signals of other fish. We think about your auditory cortex, your visual cortex, uh, all the different things that you use those regions of your brain in on a day-to-day -day basis. That can make it very challenging to link what you learn about those neurons and circuits to specific aspects of behavior. Here, it's a much simpler, simpler problem to address. And what the area I'm gonna focus on today are where the first stages of EOD processing occur. And this is in this area here, ELA, ELP in the midbrain. And so here I'm showing normal histology. So uh, here's the midline, this is a horizontal section. Here's the midline, here's the, the front of the brain. Spinal cord would be back here. Here's the lateral edge of the brain. We zoom in on this box here. And this is what I'm calling ELA, ELP. Here you see ELA and directly behind it, ELP. Now, one of the, the early discoveries in my lab, uh, spearheaded by uh, some, some great anatomical work by some, some undergraduates uh, who joined the lab in, in its very early days, uh, is that they discovered this really striking anatomical difference in this region of the brain in different groups of these fish. So this, the, the, this anatomy had only been studied in a few species. And they did the painstaking work of looking at dozens of different species. And they found this very clear difference. So here's the brain that I was just showing you quote unquote textbook brain at the time. And then here we're looking at the exact same region of the brain in a different species of this fish. And what you can see is that this same region of the brain is relatively small in proportion to the size of the rest of the brain. And it's not so obviously subdivided into separate anterior and posterior halves. So we have an enlarged ELA ELP and we have a relatively small EL. And we took all this anatomy data and we mapped it out onto the evolutionary tree, the phylogenetic tree of these fish. And so what you see here is green shows the species with a small EL, pink shows the species with an enlarged ELA ELP. You see the volume of this brain region relative to brain mass across the family tree. And as best we can tell, based on uh, using parsimony to reconstruct the evolutionary history of this trait, it seems that the ancestral trait was this relatively small EL and this enlarged ELA ELP evolved twice independently. Once in this large clade that we refer, refer to as clade A, and then once in this single branch that gives rise to a single known species called P. microphthalmus. Work by my former postdoc at the time, Michael Holman, who is now a uh, research scientist in Cologne, Germany, he found that the, the anatomy of their electroreceptors are also different. So, what I'm showing here is you see the outlines of the fish and each of these red dots locates the, uh, represents the location of one of these electroreceptors on the fish's body. And what you can see is that in the ELA ELP fish, both these clade A fish, as well as this P microphthalmus fish, the receptors are distributed all over the body. They're on the head, they're on the back, they're on the belly. Whereas in these fish with the small EL, their receptors are limited to three rosettes on the head, just three distinct clusters on the head, rather than being scattered throughout the body. Now, what might this mean for behavior? Well, this immediately led to a potential hypothesis. So if you imagine, so here we've got our signaling fish here, and then we've got a bunch of receivers out in the water listening to this fish. We can simulate that fish's signal as a simple dipole. Well, these fish are being exposed to a spatiotemporal variation in voltage in the water surrounding them. Right? I'm just showing a snapshot in time where, where you have a hot spot and a cold spot, but as the EOD waveform changes and it goes positive to negative, these hot spots and cold spots will change. So you can imagine this is spatiotemporal variation in voltage surrounding the fish. Well, it stands to reason that if you have receptors distributed all over the surface of your body, as opposed to just in small clusters on the head, you're going to be, do a much better job of sampling that spatiotemporal variation in voltage and do a better job of, of figuring out what that EOD signal you're receiving is. And so to test this hypothesis, uh, we went into the field. Um, so, so this is a field trip back in 2009. You can see I looked a little bit different back then. Um, we went to the Ogue River here in the south of Gabon uh, and went fishing, caught some fish, and then brought them back to my field station slash bedroom. And so you can see here, I've got a little playback and recording setup uh, in, in my closet here. And basically, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this because I wanna to get to the newer stuff, 
so I just want to give you the take home. What we did is we caught fish from these two different groups, brought them into the lab, and essentially asked, can they distinguish between a natural conspecific EOD produced by a member of their own species and a distorted phase shifted version of that EOD? And the way I, I, I addressed that was by doing a, a basic habituation dishabituation paradigm. Happy to answer more questions about that later, but for now, I just want, I want to keep it simple. And what we found is very clear evidence that these fish could detect, detect the difference between these EOD waveforms, and these fish could not. Now, to make an analogy uh, that may be a little more intuitive to you, um, think of the visual system. There's a whole bunch of useful information you can get about the outside world through vision by relying on things such as brightness, contrast, and pattern. But when you add the, a new element of color, a new dimension of signal variation to your, to your uh, perceptual abilities, you've opened up a whole new world of sensory variation that you are now in tune to. And so it's, this is something very similar to what happens in our fish. Uh, th these ancestral fish that lack this perceptual ability to detect differences in the waveform of EODs, they're still able to detect EODs and, and determine where they're coming from just fine. They know when they happen and they know where they're coming from. They just can't determine the fine temporal waveform of those signals in the way that these other fish can. So to summarize the, the, the important background here, we've got two different groups of fish. They differ in where their sensory receptors are located on the body. They differ in the, the anatomy of the midbrain region that's responsible for processing information from these receptors. And they differ in their perception. These fish can tell the difference between different EOD waveforms, and these fish cannot. So what I want to focus on for the rest of my time today is in addressing what are the mechanisms underlying this perceptual difference. And I'm going to start with the receptors and ask what information is encoded by different sensory receptors, and how is that information encoded? So we've known for a long time, thanks to the, the classic work of Carl Hopkins and Andy Bass, how fish that, that are able to perceive EOD variation encode these EODs. So let's imagine we've got a fish out in the environment here. It's receiving an EOD that's coming from its left side. And we're just going to keep it simple and, and imagine it's got receptors on the, on the left side of its body and receptors on the right side of its body. Well, it turns out that the receptors on the left side of its body, they're going to receive a normal polarity EOD stimulus. stimulus whereas receptors on the other side of the body are, go are going to receive a reverse polarity EOD stimulus. And the reason for that is that both receptors are looking out, right? They're embedded in the skin and they're looking out into the outside world. Well, if an EOD is coming from the left of the fish's body, that means the current is passing from left to right. So for this receptor, it's an inward current. For this receptor, it's an outward current. And so exact same current, but a flip in polarity. And it turns out that these receptors are spiking. They generate uh, spikes at the receptor cell level. And we can stimulate one of these receptors with a normal polarity EOD. And you see you get a nice spiking response. You stimulate one of these receptors with a reverse polarity EOD. And again, you get a spiking response. But you notice the timing is different. There's a small timing difference between the spikes of the receptors stimulated with a normal EOD and a reverse polarity EOD. In this case, it's a 0.4 millisecond spike timing difference. And you could imagine if I were to stretch out that EOD and make it longer, that timing difference would get bigger. And if I were to squish that EOD and make it shorter, that timing difference would get smaller. Now, if you imagine this receiving fish receiving an EOD from different locations in space, coming from the left side versus the right side, you change uh, the, the sign of the timing difference. So here, if we take left relative to right, we've got a plus 0.4 millisecond timing difference. Here, coming from the right, we've got a minus 0.4 timing difference, okay? So we have a classic, what we would call temporal code, in which the location of the EOD is encoded into the sign of the timing difference. Does left come before right, or does right come before left? And the waveform of the EOD is encoded into the magnitude of that timing difference. What about these, these other fish? These fish that cannot perceive variation in EODs? Well, it turns out their receptors are completely different in their physiology. So this is work done by my former graduate student, Krista Baker, 
who's now a uh, postdoc at Malamurthy's lab in Princeton. And instead of generating spikes, these receptors generate continuous oscillations, even at rest in the absence of stimulation. They generate these continuous electrical oscillations at frequencies of around one to three kilohertz. Now, when you stimulate these receptors, the effect of this is to cause those receptors to reset their phase of oscillation and increase the amplitude of these oscillations. So here you see Krista stimulated with a single EOD stimulus. There's five repetitions with the responses overlaid on top of each other. You see before each stimulus, these oscillations are free running. But as soon as she hits it with the stimulus, the phase is reset to a particular phase in the oscillation cycle, okay? Now this is just one receptor. In reality, the fish, of course, is monitoring all of its receptors at the same time. So let's look at the situation. Let's keep it manageable and just look at three example receptors instead of an entire population. So here, a simple electrical stimulus, a square pulse is delivered. You've got three different receptors. You see they all re increase the amplitude of their oscillations and reset the phase of their oscillations. And what you notice is right after the stimulus, because they've all been reset to the exact same phase, they are all in phase with each other. The peaks of these oscillations are lined up. But each of these oscillators has its own characteristic oscillation frequency. And so as time goes on, they slip more and more out of phase with each other. They become less and less synchronized. So what this is means is that in response to a stimulus, these receptors transiently synchronize. They have a brief moment of synchronization where they come into synchrony with each other and they quickly slip out of synchrony with each other. And to my knowledge, this is the first sensory system out in the periphery where it's been, this has been shown to be a, the sensory coding mechanism that you have uh, oscill oscillators, independent oscillators that detect stimuli by briefly synchronizing their oscillations. Well, what do these receptors encode? Well, first let's go back and look at these spiking receptors in the other group of fish that are able to perceive EOD variation. This is just a different way of showing you what I already showed you. So we can present positive polarity electrical stimulus, negative polarity electrical stimulus, in this case, a simple square pulse. And we sh I show responses to 10 stimulus rep repetitions superimposed on top of each other. And you see you have receptors on the left side of the body versus the right side of the body. They generate spikes with a 0.1 millisecond spike timing difference in response to a 0.1 millisecond square pulse. You increase the duration of that square pulse to 0.2 milliseconds, and you increase the timing difference to 0.2 milliseconds. And I'm not going to show you this, but I could do this across a wide range. We could go up to 0.4 milliseconds, and it would create a 0.4 millisecond timing difference. We could go down to 0.05 milliseconds, and it would create a 0.05 millisecond timing difference. That spike timing difference perfectly tracks the duration of the stimulus waveform. What about these oscillating receptors? Well, we do the same thing here. And what you can see, again, you've got these free running oscillations, and then you get a phase reset after the stimulus. And it turns out receptors on opposite sides of the body reset 180 degrees out of phase with each other. Okay, they are perfectly 180 degrees out of phase with each other. Let's increase the duration of the pulse. Well, this has no effect on the response. They're still just 180 degrees out of phase with each other. Okay. So this tells us that the fish that we had previously shown using behavioral evidence are unable to perceive EOD waveform variation, they actually have electroreceptors that don't even encode that variation in the first place. Very satisfying result for us. But importantly, these oscillating receptors, they do encode the EOD time of occurrence, right? The fish knows when an EOD has occurred because its receptors suddenly synchronize or asynchronize on opposite sides of the body, okay? So they, they have information about when an EOD has occurred. And they also have information about where that EOD is coming from in space because of this 180 degree phase shift, right? If a signal is coming from left to right, then you might have a, a, a certain phase shift and it's gonna be, both of those are gonna be 180 degrees flipped if the signal is coming from the other side of the fish's body. So to summarize what's going on at the receptor level, We've got, in these two fish with different anatomies of sensory receptors, their receptors also differ fundamentally in their physiology. They, these spiking receptors, they encode EOD location into the sign of a timing difference and EOD waveform into the magnitude of a timing difference. These oscillating receptors, 
they encode EOD location into the sign of a timing difference, whether it's left before right or right before left, but they do not encode EOD waveform into the magnitude of that timing difference. There is no variation in just how large that timing difference is. So what I wanna talk about for the rest of my talk is what's going on in the central circuits that process the information coming from these receptors. How do central sensory circuits evolve to process new information coming from sensory receptors? So here we are looking again at the circuitry in the brain. Uh, and this is some classic anatomical work by uh, Munini and Len Mailer and uh, Matt Freeman, uh, who's now M Matthew Shu Freeman, who, who he was a PhD student in Carl Hopkins lab at the time. And within this area, ELA, there are two cell types, large cells and small cells. And what I'm showing here is, this is showing that in black is a single labeled axon of an NELL neuron that projects up into the ELA. And what you can see is that axon comes in, it synapses on a large cell, go, keeps going for a ways, synapses on another large cell, and then all hell breaks loose. This axon, it starts to form branches, multiple collaterals. It, those branches head off in all sorts of different directions and they double back on each other and twist and turn and come back and forth, right? Forming basically a tangled mess of a single axon. This, the width of this brain region here is about a millimeter or so, but the length of the axon starting from this point here is about seven millimeters, right? It's like a small intestine that's just wrapped up in there. And what this is suggestive of is an axonal delay line that having this elongated axon that takes a long way to get to, to all of its targets, to all of these small cells that a synapse is on, constitute a delay line. It's gonna hit these large cells with a short delay. Then it's gonna hit a few small cells with a relatively short delay, other small cells with a longer delay and other small cells with an even longer delay. So it's systematically delaying the time of arrival of a synaptic input to this population of small cells. The large cells, here's a single labeled large cell, they project to the small cells, okay? And they do so, by a fairly typical direct route, right? They just take a beeline straight to their different targets. And it turns out the large cell is inhibitory. It inhibits the small cells. So we've, the small cells, to summarize, they get two inputs. They get a single excitatory input direct from the hindbrain, which is subject to a delay, depending on the length of the axon before it reaches that small cell. They also receive an inhibitory input from a large cell, and they're the output neurons that project to ELP the next stage in the circuit. So these small cells, they're the time comparator neurons. They're the ones that make the, the, the uh, analysis of the timing difference between receptors on different sides of the body, because they're the first point in the circuit that receives convergent input from different receptive fields. So we can imagine here, look at this cartoon small cell here. It gets delayed excitatory input through this long winding axon from the left side, and it gets fairly direct inhibitory input from this large cell on the other side. And for comparison, here's a small cell that's very similar, but it gets input after a much shorter excitatory delay. And all the small cells project into ELP where we have what we call multipolar cells. And now this uh, study of how these small cells detect these timing differences was the PhD work of my former grad student, Ariel Lyons-Warren. Um, she's now a postdoc and a medical resident at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, and she collaborated with, with uh, Tsunehiko Kohashi, a former postdoc in my lab who's back in Japan, and Steve Menrick, a, a professor in the psychiatry department at the med school at WashU. And I don't have time to go through her entire dissertation, so I just wanna give you the key take home for my talk here. Here's that same cartoon diagram I was showing you. Here's another way of looking at this circuit from a bit more of a functional perspective. We've got our stimulus, a simple square pulse here. One side of the body responds to the start of the pulse, another side of the body responds to the end of the pulse, and that response to the start, that feeds into an excitatory input to our small cell, but it's subject to a delay through the delay line, delta T, and the other side of the body that responds to the offset of the pulse, it inhibits our small cell via a large cell. And importantly, <clears throat> Delta T, this delay, it varies across the population of small cells. Some small cells get excitation with a short delay. Some small cells get excitation with a long delay. So let's imagine here, look at a small cell that gets input with a relatively short axonal delay. We've got our stimuli of different durations. 
We get excitation in response to the start of the pulse, inhibition in response to the end of the pulse, but the excitation is delayed by some amount, delta T. Now you can see for these four stimuli, excitation and inhibition coincide for these two stimuli. So inhibition blocks the excitation and the cell doesn't respond. For these two longer pulses, the delayed excitation gets in before the inhibition and the cell responds. Keep everything the same, but now increase the axonal delay. So we have a small cell that gets input with a longer delay. And you can see you change which of those four stimuli the cell will respond to and the cell will not respond to. This is what we would refer to as delay line anti-coincidence detection. Very similar to delay line coincidence detection you may have heard of, especially in the uh, barn owl auditory system in which you've got inputs from the two ears uh, subject to a relative delay. And if those relatively delayed inputs reach the postsynaptic target at the same time, they're gonna excite the cell maximally. It's gonna detect coincidence. Cell's going to respond. You have delay line coincidence detection. Here, it's not two excitatory inputs, it's an excitatory input and an inhibitory input. And so the cell is only going to respond when those two inputs are not coincidence. So we have delay line anti-coincidence detection, okay? This is the basic mechanism by which the small cells begin to decode these small spike timing differences and, and convert that code into a novel distributed population code. So here's the big question. We've got this circuit here in these fish with ELA, ELP, where we, we basically know the first steps of how they recode uh, these spike timing differences and detect these small timing differences and encode them into a new format. How does the EL compare? How does this ancestral small EL compare? And how does the, the, the that one species, if you recall, that independently evolves the same ELA ELP phenotype, how does it compare at a cellular circuit physiological level? Well, this was the research project of my former uh, postdoc, Alejandro Belez, who he's now a uh, professor at uh, San Francisco State University. And he basically asked some, some basic questions in comparing these, these brains. What cell types are there, right? We've got these three different cell types, small cells, large cells, and multipolar cells. Which, if any of those cell types are found in EL? How are they wired up? Are they, are they connected to each other in similar ways? And what might any differences between them mean for information processing? So let's start with uh, replicating the previous work that had been done to, to lead to the, the, the understanding that we already had going into this project. So first, demonstrating that any LL neurons project to ELA. Well, Alejandro used a classic technique. He injected the tracer neurobiotin into ELA. And after processing the brains and doing the histology, what you could find is you see darkly stained axon tracks and you can follow them back through the axon pathways from the hindbrain to the midbrain, the lateral lemniscus. And if you tra trace them all the way back to the hindbrain, you see you get cells, cell bodies labeled in NELL, zoomed in here. So confirmed, NELL neurons project up into ELA. What about that within ELA, large cells inhibit small cells? Well, for this, Alejandro used immunohistochemistry against the, the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA. And when he did this, what he found is you would get large stained cell bodies, and then you would get smaller unstained cell bodies. But those small unstained cell bodies were surrounded by stain. And this is because these large cells provide a calyx-like synapse around the small cell bodies. So, so they, the, the synapse from these large cells envelops the entire soma nearly of these small cells. And so this dark ring surrounding the soma is clear evidence of an inhibitory synaptic terminal coming from these large cells. So basically, we have stained GABAergic large cells providing synaptic input to unstained small cells. Then the last step, verifying that small cells are the output neurons that project to multipolar cells in ELP. Well, here, Alejandro again did neurobiotin injection, this time in ELP instead of ELA. And when he did that, if you zoom in on ELA and ELP, within ELP, you can see multipolar cells that are close to the injection site. And within ELA, you see stained small cells, but no stained large cells, okay? 
basic technique to reconstruct this circuit. It turns out when Alejandro did the exact same experiments in the species that independently evolved the same ELA ELP phenotype, he got the exact same results. Inject neurobiotin into ELA, you find filled, small, filled uh, an ELL neurons in the hindbrain. Do the GABA immunohistochemistry, and you look in ELA, you get large stained cells, and you get small unstained cells that are surrounded by stain. Do an injection of, of neurobiotin into uh, ELP, and if you look near the injection site, you find filled multipolar cells, and if you look back in ELA, you find filled small cells, but no filled large cells. Okay, so as best we can tell, exact same circuit. And I should say, Alejandro also did a bunch of physiology uh, on the, the, the cells in this network uh, to, to make these claims uh, of these similarities, but I just don't have time to go into that today. Here's the real kicker. When we look in the ancestral EL, the species that has no apparent ELA ELP, but a much smaller EL, we find the exact same circuitry. So now we can't do an injection in ELA or ELP because we can't see a distinct ELA ELP. But Alejandro could do an injection in the anterior edge of EL or the posterior edge of EL. And when he did an injection at the anterior edge, he found the filled NELL neurons in the hindbrain. When he did the GABA immunohistochemistry, he found stained large cells and unstained small cells that were surrounded by stain. When he did an injection of neurobiotin in the posterior end of EL, he found filled multipolar cells near the injection site. And up in the anterior edge of EL, he found filled small cells, but no filled large cells. So what is going on here? We've got two different versions of the same sensory system. One of those versions has a much more difficult computational problem to solve, right? In the ancestral circuit, it's a binary problem. All it's got to do is figure out the sign of the timing difference. Is it left before right or is it right before left, right? That's a simple problem. The other circuit, it has to figure that out. Is it left before right and right before left? But it also has to figure out the magnitude of the timing differences, just how big that timing difference is, right? That's, that's a much bigger computational problem. But the same basic circuit at a cellular level is found in both. So that leaves us with the fundamental question. How can a neural circuit evolve to perform new computations without adding any new parts? Well, it seems that the clear difference between the brains of these different fish is in the presence or absence of these long axonal delay lines that I described. So here, again, we're looking at single axonal reconstructions. So these are single histological images where you can, it's faint, but you can maybe see uh, some stained axon here. This is a single stained axon. And then what you're seeing down here, traced out, the red bits show the parts that are visible in this particular image. And then the black bits show the reconstructions of that axon that were from sections above or below this particular section. Okay, so here's a complete reconstruction of one axon in these three different groups of fish. And what you see is in clade A and P. microphthalmus, these fish that have evolved in ELA, ELP, and are able to perceive species differences in waveform, their axons have more branches, they turn more, they double back more. And the fish, the species here, <clears throat> that has a small EL and cannot perceive differences in EOD waveform, it has a boring, just typical axon that just takes a straight trajectory straight to its target, just like any normal axon would do. This is showing the same thing, but instead of a single labeled axon, it's a labeling of an entire axon tract. And so what you're seeing here is that you're seeing axon segments scattered throughout, and the color is illustrating depth through the stack of sections to give you some sense of the three-dimensional structure here. And basically what you can see is in these two brains, these axons are a tangled mess, right? They're going every which way. They're branching, twisting, turning around, going in every direction. In this brain, it's a typical axon tract, right? It just goes straight through to its target. We decided to, to, to back this up by doing some electrophysiology to show whether these delay lines are actually functional. Um, and the basic idea here was we're doing vitro physiology, record intracellularly from multipolar cells that get the input from small cells, and then we'll, we'll provide an extracellular stimulus to the axon tracts 
that goes to the large cells and the small cells and records synaptic, polysynaptic responses from multipolar cells. Well, the idea is if you've got the same circuit in these two brains, but in this circuit, you've got these delay lines where you've got different small cells getting input with different delays, that should result in excitatory synaptic inputs to, to multipolar cells with a range of delays. And that's exactly what we found. So here are some confocal fills of these multipolar cells. And if you look at, so here's artifact showing the electrical stimulation. And if you look at the excitatory synaptic potentials occurring in these multipolar cells, here you see it's a pretty boring, typical short delay EPSP. In these brains, what you find is you get more complex EPSPs with multiple onset times, okay? Consistent with this idea that we have delay lines driving small cells with different latencies. So where did the circuit come from in the first place? Well, one idea we have is that uh, these fish with the ancestral EL, where they have this large cell to small cell inhibitory microcircuit, it might exist for directional sensitivity. So you can imagine you've got stimuli coming from, from one side of the body, from the left side in this case. Here, this input is low or in this input is high right after the stimulus. So in that situation, excitation is gonna be greater than inhibition, small cell will, will respond. Keep everything the same, but now flip where the stimulus is coming from. Now it's coming from the right. And now it's high on the left side while it's low on the left side. So now you've got more inhibition than excitation. The cell won't respond. You've got a simple directional detector, right? You've got a small cell that detects when the signal is coming from one side of the body. And if you had a mirror image cell doing the exact opposite, wired up in the exact opposite way, it would detect stimuli coming from the other side of the body. So this is our model for evolutionary change in this circuit. All of the original building blocks for this ELA ELP are found in the ancestral EL. All the cell types are there. They're wired up in the necessary way. And this excitation inhibition microcircuit here may mediate directional sensitivity in the system. The big fundamental change that occurred was that there was an addition of delay lines in ELA so that it could expand on this directional sensitivity to establish sensitivity to small timing differences that code for the EOD waveform. In addition, there was an increased number of cells in ELA in ELP. So, so there's more small cells and more multipolar cells to process the more information coming in. And actually those cells have also have become more segregated in the EL. They're, they're somewhat interspersed. They're not so cleanly separated as in they are in ELA ELP. And importantly, these changes happened in parallel in two different lineages of these fish. Two different groups of these fish both convergently evolved the same behavioral phenotype and they felt had the exact same changes happening in their sensory system. So let, let, I want to end by, by getting a bit bigger picture and uh, talking about the evolution of sensory perception. So what this work shows is that dramatic changes in information processing can result from relatively minor evolutionary modifications to existing neural circuits, right? Evolutionary history matters. Neural circuits do not evolve from scratch to solve new computational problems, but build on existing circuits. And if we really wanna understand why a given circuit works the way it does, we need to understand where that circuit came from. So I talked today about this one group of fish and how they evolved this ability to detect small timing differences in their signals. But there are two other groups of, the, of, of electric fish that also have this ability to, to, to detect very small timing differences in the signals they receive and it turns out they solve those problems in completely different ways. Three different groups of fish, they have completely different substrates for detecting small timing differences. Many of you may be familiar with sound vocalization circuits and the use of timing differences between the ears to localize where a sound is coming from in space, right? So both birds and mammals also use small timing differences in their sensory processing. And it turns out barn owls detect these small timing differences in a way that is completely different from how gerbils detect these very small timing differences. And both are completely different from these other three circuits. So as I outline in, in my uh, book chapter here, we've got five different circuits that have been well studied with the question of detecting submillisecond differences in the arrival of, of, of sensory inputs and five different solutions. There is no reason to expect that there should be a single neural solution to a given behavioral problem, right? This work underscores that we cannot fully understand a neural circuit without understanding where it came from. 
Importantly, we cannot extrapolate findings from one species or clade to another. And so I just want to end by, by really hammering home this point. If you think about uh, what, what is it when we talk about a model system in organ, model organism in neuroscience, what are we really talking about? Well, here I've showed you these two different groups of fish, and the most recent common ancestor between them was around 30 to 40 million years ago. Well, the most recent common ancestor between rodents and primates was 85 to 95 million years ago. If I can't study the brain of this fish and extrapolate what I discovered to, th to this fish, I certainly can't study the brain of this mouse and extrapolate what I find to the brain of this primate. Now, this is not to, to, to criticize work done on rodents. Obviously, a lot of very important groundbreaking work has been done uh, in neuroscience using rodents. The important point is that whatever has been found, you simply cannot assume that it applies universally to, to all animals or even to any one particular animal. The only way to find out what holds across species and what might be unique to particular lineages is by doing the actual comparative work to see what is similar and what is different. And so with that, I just want to end uh, with my acknowledgments, thank the various people in my lab uh, that helped contribute to this work and our various sources of funding. And I'm excited to, to talk to all of you uh, and answer any questions that you may have.